Again, welcome to New Day. We are continuing our series uh, through the church of Ephesus. So again, we're starting not in the book, but all the way back into Acts. So if you want to open up your Bibles, tablets, phones, whatever you're comfortable using, to Acts chapter 19, uh, we're going to start in verse 21 today. Now, uh, what we're going to see is, is some of the events. We're starting to see people come to Christ. And I think we're, there's a this certain vein of Christianity that gives this message that when we come to God, everything starts being great and your life is going to turn around. And that's true. But a lot of times people mean your circumstances, your earthly wealth, all of those things are what's going to change. And what we're going to see in this text, it's not exactly what happens in, a, in the city of Ephesus. Right? And, uh, and I think there's a lot of times we feel like if I do the right thing, then I'll have the right thing happen to me. Right? It's called belief in a just world. Right? That's what that psychological term is called. Unfortunately, that's just not always how the world works. I learned this the first time I ever got a spanking as a kid. I was a wee lad in about third grade, and my parents had just moved to a two-story house. And so, you know, for those of you in two-story homes, you hear every footstep above you, right? And it was one of those days where all the cousins were gathered. Now, I was one of those kids that was like, if you looked at me the wrong way, I cried and I said, I am so sorry. Like, I would just, and I'll go put myself in my room. Like, I was that kid, right? Uh, it did not take much to punish me. And so my cousins were up there, and two or three times, someone came upstairs and said, hey, y'all cut it out, you're making a lot of noise. We had the whole chandelier's moving, y'all gotta cut it out. Well, the third time, mom said, you are all getting a spanking. Now, you all did not include the old teenagers who were doing all the stuff, first off. B, there were some of us younger ones, and I was literally sitting in a computer chair, huddled in the corner like, I don't want any part of this. And I thought, I'll be fine. I was not. They grabbed my little cousin, my next cousin, and I was put in there, and I got my first spanking unjustly. I was sitting in a corner. I was like, I was doing what I was supposed to do, but like, we couldn't show favoritism. I said, why? I didn't do anything wrong. You could have at least, it's not favoritism if I was right. But I learned that lesson. That's just not always how the world works, right? Sometimes you are going to be grouped in with those around you. And it may not be your fault. And when we may sit there and say, God, this isn't fair. And for those of you who walk through us when we come to the time of Easter and the cross, you learn very quickly they weren't fair to Jesus either. God is not going to have us go through something he himself did not go through first. They weren't fair to Jesus, and they may not be fair to us. So let's look here at Acts chapter 19, starting verse 21. It says, After these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a little while. And at that time, there was no little disturbance concerning the way. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, he brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades. And he said, men, you know that this business that we have, our wealth, and you see in here, not only in Ephesus, but in all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there's danger not only in this trade of ours that may come into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing. She may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all of Asia and the whole world worship. So God begins to work on the heart of Paul. He says, okay, you can, you've set up a base snap since things are happening. What happened last week is we saw these itinerant exorcists come in and try to cast a demon out. And they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we command you to leave. And the demon responds with, Jesus I know, Paul I've heard of, who are you? And he beats them up, strips them naked, and kicks them out. And in that event, you see the first converts in the city of Ephesus. It says that they came and they burned their sorcery scrolls. And so you, it wasn't until this huge supernatural event did Paul ever really get to get his foothold in Ephesus. So now that it's there, and now that disciples are multiplying from the 12 he started with the first week to now, he says, I can leave. 
I'm going to go to Rome. That's actually where he's wanting to end up. But the Lord is leading me. He says, I've got to go to Jerusalem first. And if you don't know the context, when Paul, if Paul goes back to Jerusalem, it is certain death. He was a Pharisee. And now he is excommunicated. Which means that he's a full-blown heretic. If he goes back to Jerusalem, he's as good as dead. But he says, God is going to tell me, I'm going to go to where I want to go through there. And he says, we were called to reach Macedonia, so I'm sending two very faithful men. I'm sending Timothy and Erastus. Now, if you don't know who these two men are, Timothy was called Paul's spiritual son. This was somebody that Paul mentored, Paul poured himself into. He wrote two letters famously to him at the end of our, end of our Bible, First and Second Timothy. He knew him through his mother and grandmother. Right? He says, because you had these, this mother and grandmother who were faithful, they raised you up to be faithful. And Paul knew them. And he taught him to be a, not just a, a, an evangelist, but to be a pastor. The writings to him and to Titus are called the pastoral letters. So really, Paul's not as much a pastor as he is an evangelist. What's the difference? The evangelist's job was to go around and just tell people about Jesus, raise up a pastor, and leave. Right? He was a missionary. Timothy was called to go somewhere and stay. Make sure their doctrine is right. Make sure people were being taken care of. Paul did pastor a few churches in his missionary journey, but for the most part, he sent somebody else up and, leave, and left. Then he had Erastus. Erastus was a deacon in the church of Corinth. And uh, we, we have not talked about Corinth yet in our church, but if you just want to flip through there with your Bible, you'll find out they had a whole lot of problems. Right? You don't send the weakest link to Corinth. Right? You don't send the new guy. You send the hardened guy who can keep things in ship shape. That's who you send to Corinth. It was a tough place. So he was faithful. So he sent these two men to Macedonia. That means whatever God was putting on Paul's heart, he was not going to stop until he put the best of the best to go before him. To go and work there. Now imagine this. They are back in Corinth. And they got a letter from Paul saying, go to Macedonia. That was about a 3,000 mile distance. That's long today. Like, I don't want to drive that or fly that. Could you imagine? You're just sitting at home. And then Paul's like, greetings. Love you guys. You got to pack up and go 3,000 miles across the world. And they did. Now, I have no idea how long something like that would take back in the ancient world. You would take a lot of ships and things like that to, to chart your course. But 3,000 miles. I think we forget the scope of the gospel at this point. Where we were in this little city called Jerusalem. Where Jesus did all of his work within about 300 miles of this one little city. And here we are, probably about 20, 20 years or so after the death of Christ. 3,000 miles from there the gospel has spread. God was doing huge things in the world. And then it says there was no little disturbance about the way. Again, remember, these were considered a sect of Judaism. For those of you who have been in our midweek and our missional communities, we're talking about that right now. What that means and what that looks like. And so it's not too late to jump in and join us during the week. You can look online. And so who was affected by the way? By the Christians. The pagan merchants. Right? If you, if you read this text... Right? If we looked in the last thing, what happened? They went and they burned their spell books and their poultices and their potions and their witchcraft. And now, those who sell those things are angry. Like, hey, wait a minute. No one's buying our stuff anymore. We're going to go broke. And here's the thing. Well, the reason people gave it up is they saw the power of the name of Jesus. And they still had nothing in the thousands of... Of, of coins they would spend on these spell books and poultices. These talismans that they were supposed to ward off evil. It did nothing. But then there was the name of Jesus. It changed everything. So what happened? He was a silversmith. He would make silver idols. He would erect the shrines to Artemis. So he had these deep theological reasons for standing against Christianity. Yeah, no. Had nothing to do with that. It was all about money. They were hurting the pocketbooks. So he gathered the other disgruntled merchants. Right? And so he gets them together and says, guys, we're going to go broke if we don't stop these Christians. Oh, and by the way, people will stop our, worshiping Artemis too. And we, we don't want that. But really, we're going to go broke. And if you look, that's what's going to happen. More often than not, 
Persecution does not come because you start just seeing converts. Persecution is going to come when Christianity disrupts the, the money trains where evil is going. When you start hurting somebody's pocketbook, you become a threat. Right? That's when somebody, that's when you get at somebody's attention. Right? And then, and here's the reality. This church, this body of believers in Ephesus was so much of a threat, it was disrupting this quote unquote largest cult in the world. The city of Artemis. And here's just the truth. And when I talk about the church, I don't just mean your local church, but I mean, think of the body of Christ. The body, if the body of Christ is not changing things around them, or more importantly, making an impact in whose lives are there on a weekly basis, because that's really what a church is called to first, is to those to disciple those who are there, and it's not changing things in their lives or their meaning or their pocketbooks, then that church is no threat to the enemy whatsoever. That church is just a glorified social club that has God somewhere in the name. If the heart isn't to reach people for the gospel, including those who are here, you say, hey, wait a minute, Pastor, I'm already saved already. You don't need to reach me the gospel. If there's anything I've learned, I need the gospel more today than I did the day I was saved. I was ignorant of a lot of my sins when I became to Christ. I thought I had it all worked out and I had confessed it all. And I was going to be perfect. And then it turns out, man, there's a whole bunch of ugly stuff under here. And every time I started growing a little bit, I was like, ooh, I thought I was done. And here I am, been walking with Christ since I was 14 years old. And I'm like, Lord, I just need you, period. Because everything in here is broken. I'm not getting better. You are making me better. In other words, there's not something in me I'm able to just muster because I'm a good person. It's Christ is saying, I'm changing you, and I'm weeding these things out of you, and I'm letting you know about them. That's when we talk about accountability with one another. Your first question should just be, what's the Holy Spirit convicting you of? Right? Because you can look at somebody's life and pick out a hundred billion different sins. But God may be saying, hey, this is what I'm working on right now. I'm working on this with this person right now. And that's how a church can shoulder alongside and hold accountability. And so they're saying, Paul did this. Paul is changing everything all over Asia. He's taking our money. He's taking our jobs. Why? Because he says his God is not made by human hands. And he looks down on us because we make our gods. Now think about that moment for just, for just, just a second. He has no problem admitting Artemis has no power unless we make idols of her. In other words, Artemis only has the power we give her. She doesn't have some intrinsic worth or something to be worshipped. She's not all powerful. She's only as powerful as the people will allow her to be. See, in a lot of times, we, we, you know, we always look at the Bible and it says that man was made in God's image. When you look at these religions, those gods are made in man's image. They reflect their cultures. They reflect who they are. So he says, look, we have this God who will be powerless if we don't sell more idols. And we don't want that. Now, if I was a recent convert to Christianity, maybe, maybe I'm not even that deep of a thinker. But if I heard, wait a minute, i got to buy those idols so that our God can have power? Or I can serve a God who is all-powerful all by himself? I think I know the choice I'm going to make. The one who doesn't need me but wants me. Right? He, he doesn't need me. He wants me. He doesn't need you. He wants you. He can do whatever he wants. But he chose to die for you and for me. And so Jesus just has a way of making people uncomfortable. That's just the nature of walking with Christ. For all of us as believers, like I said, you really start to realize, man, I got a lot to work on. I start to get uncomfortable. And I'm uncomfortable in things I used to be very comfortable in. Right, our old life, right, those chains, those chains made nice blankets. Right, I didn't want to always let them go. The bondage I was in is, it was like I was comfortable. I've known it my whole life. I've known my bitterness since I was a kid. I've, I've known my loneliness, my depression, my anxiety. And I don't want to let it go. Man, I have this addiction or I hate this person. I don't really want to let it go. Like I say I do, but really at the end of the day, if I had the opportunity to either keep hating this person or be chained, I'll just keep my chain. And a lot of us, and this was me, said, Lord, cure me of depression. 
right? And he would give me opportunities like, oh, but now not like that. No, not like that. Cure me of anxiety. So he put me in front of people. No, not like that. Right? No, 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 no. That's not how I just want to wake up one day and not feel any of this stuff no more. Instead of him just saying, you know what? Give me change. Just give it over. Let me have it. Let me break it. Let me take it on me. That's what the gospel message is. Is, is Jesus then doesn't say, well, then muster it up and be good. And he say, drop it. He just says, give it to me. And I'll break it. I'll set you free. I'll make it happen. And that accountability can be horrifying. Right? We love the, right, our, our, our verses is, you know, God, the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. We see it promised in the Old Testament and the New. We love that verse. But that should be horrifying. That means he watches everything I watch. He does everything I do. Every little thing I've ever done, he's right there with. And that's comforting when I'm hurting. That should be horrifying when I'm sinning. It's like, oh man, yeah, he's right there, isn't he? He, he didn't left me. He's, he's still here. He's still watching. And he still loves me. Right? But that, that accountability can be horrifying for all of us. And this thought that, man, God is not really like me. He's so different. He's so much more powerful. God doesn't owe me anything. But He gives it to me anyway. That's when we say, why do we, why do we come to Christ? Is, yes, there's, I have philosophical reasons. I have scientific reasons, historical reasons. But none of that's going to bring me to heaven. The reality is, do I believe that He is God? Uh, that He was raised on the third day, resurrected in the body, and that He would take my sin, take my place, and die for me. That's what grace just looks like. He would do this for us. So here's our first point. Christians, whether you reason or not, by our nature, if we are walking with God even a little bit, we disrupt the darkness around them. Christians disrupt the darkness around them. It's the natural cause of just being a Christian. Right? You are filled with the Holy Spirit now. That means no matter where I go, the Spirit of God is with me and it is a difference because God is with me and we are there. Because He never leaves me nor forsakes me. So He's with me at my job. He's with me Oh, when someone's trying to cheat me, he's with me when I'm there and he's rejoicing with me. He's, he's rejoicing when I'm with my family. He's with me when I lose my temper. He's there. And even when we fail, there's still the Spirit inside which will change the world around us because it is Jesus that does the changing. So let's continue on. Verse 28. So when they heard this, they were enraged and they were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And the city was filled with confusion. They rushed and they gathered to this theater and bragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. And when Paul wished to go among the crowd, the disciples wouldn't let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him, don't go into the theater. Now some would cry out one thing and some another. The assembly was just in confusion. And most of them didn't even know why they had come together. And some of the crowd had they prompted Alexander, whom the Jews put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hands, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized he was a Jew, for the next two hours, they cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so here you have the silversmith, and he gets his guys together. And they say, you know what? We're going to take these guys down. We're going to take Christianity down. Let's go to the theater. Now, this theater was huge. It held tens of thousands of people. This was a massive theater. And so they all started to gather people in there. And a lot of people were like, cool, what are we doing? And they're like, I don't know. Everybody's going. Well, I'm going to go too. I don't want to miss out. Right? It's like that mob mentality. Everyone starts showing up. They don't even know why they're there. Right? Well, I just, it's the fear of missing out. That's why they're there. Right? We've all been there. We've all had those moments where it's like, man... God, I have no idea how I found myself here. But I definitely followed the wrong group of people to get here. Right? Like, I, I may not have chosen this if I was sitting there by myself, but because of who I roll with, man, I'm in a place I wish I never would have been. And that's what's happening here. Why? Because there was this great reality of something on the line. Money. They wanted their money. So they were going to do whatever it took to get it. They were confused what they were yelling about. They just yelled. They didn't know why. Please don't ever allow this to be your reality. 
Like, don't be one of those people who's out there being loud and vocal and you have no idea why. Why we, we need to be informed. We need to take stock of what we're saying. And that includes of the gospel. Right? What we're standing for, what we're standing against, and why. Like, that's actually biblical in First Peter. It says give, um, to give a response to those who are asking about the faith, right? The word there is a- apologia. It gives an apology, which doesn't mean like you and I mean it. It means to give a defense. Give a reason for why I believe what I believe. Now, I'm not saying, oh, don't tell people about Jesus and you can write, unless you can write a three-page treatise on, you know, the Trinity and all that. Remember, that's not what we're saying. I do need to be able to at least articulate, this is who I was and this is who I am because of the cross. I at least need to be able to say that. And that means there may be some arguments you and I don't need to be getting in. Right? I may disagree. I may even be right. But if I can't sit there and just give a rational reason why, it's better if I just sit back. Because then we're going to go nowhere. It's just two opinions clashing. That's all it is. And all it makes is an argument and unhappy people. No one's going to have change. That's not pursuing truth. That's just wanting to be right. And I've said this before. Man, do I wish that was biblical. That God said, not just love your neighbor, but always be right all the time. Right? Oh, that would be the best. But no... That's not what he says. He says, if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he's naked, you clothe him. If he's thirsty, you give him water. Because you love your enemy. You love the church. You love your family. You love people. Right or not. Now, that doesn't mean the truth of the gospel doesn't matter. Absolutely that matters. If if you've been around us any length of time, we care about what the scriptures say and, and articulating that as best we can contextually. But our life is not about being right. It's about being like Christ. And there's going to be moments where the truth will shine and people go, oh, I get it. And that's where we stand for truth. So don't always put, the other thing is, if you see a whole bunch of people yelling, don't put a whole bunch of stock that those people might be right. Just because there's a bunch of people gathered and they be in the name of something or not, just because there's a bunch that believe it does not make it so. So who do they grab? companions of Paul, right? two Macedonian men, because they said, we know they are just like that guy. So let's grab them. And I, I couldn't even imagine that. Here we have these two missionary guys coming from a far off place, and they're being snatched up to a theater filled with 30,000 people screaming at them, yelling at them, some of which don't even know why they're yelling. Look, if you haven't been told you might suffer for Christianity, you've not been told the full gospel. This is biblical. Jesus says, if the world hates me, it will hate you. No servant is greater than its master. If the world rejects me, it will reject you. That means there's going to come a point in your Christian walk when you will face opposition by family, by co-workers, by somebody, and you're going to be applied pressure to not believe anymore. Because it'll be easier. They may not tell you, no, they're not gonna, it's not going to be that open. They're not going to be like, well, I'll treat you better if you just renounce Christ. That's not the way it works. Most of us, as people find out you're Christian, and they just treat you poorly. Right? And then it's, do I live it out or do I not? Do I go to work and do I just keep it to myself because I don't want confrontation? Do I go out in public and just keep it to myself because I don't, I don't really want someone to get in my face about it? So these men are drugged. And what's Paul's response? He runs. He's like, you're not going to suffer without me. I'm coming too. And the disciples are like, no, Paul, you can't go in there. And he even says some Asiarchs. That means Paul, this, this started to rattle throughout the churches that Paul's trying to get to this theater. People wrote letters saying, Paul, stop going. Right? That's how long they're trying to hold this guy back. It's like there's people from outside saying, Paul, you've got to stop. You can't go in there. Trust God. But Paul's just thinks like, no, you don't understand. I'm supposed to suffer. Let me in there. Right? He has the opposite response of so many, which is, Lord, I don't ever want to suffer. He's like, where's the next place I get to hurt a little bit? I've been a little too comfortable a little too long. Let me go, Jesus. Let me go. He trusted God. But his other thing was, he was like, I'm not going to let my followers suffer and not be a part of it. 
And even officials. That's what the Asiarchs were. These were officials who said, Paul, you can't go. This wasn't the first time. As a matter of fact, when Paul began preaching the gospel, he got so fiery, they're like, we're going to kill you. And he said, try it. Bring it. I'm right here. And the disciples were like, Paul, God has a plan for you, and you can't do it dead. And so they, they, eventually, they eventually convinced him, to, and they lower him in a basket out of the wall of Damascus so he can escape. And I bet you he was grumbling the entire time. Big people want to go in there. And dum, dum, I just want to go in there and preach the gospel. They won't let me. Right? The whole time. That's Paul. Right? He's scared. He knew it. We, we see another place uh, after this in the book of Acts. He's, they get shipwrecked, which that's pretty bad enough. And they're on this island, and the snake comes out and it bites him. And they all look because it's a venomous snake. And what does he do? He shakes the snake off into the fire and just keeps on walking. Right? One of my favorite lines from any movie, right? Movie Predator. Right? Jesse the Body Ventura. I ain't got time to bleed. That was Paul. Right? I ain't got time to die. I ain't got time for snakes. I ain't got time to get whipped. I ain't got time for prison. God has a plan for me, and I'm going to keep moving forward. Period. That's the Christian walk. It's not sunshines and rainbows and unicorns. It's firefighters at the gates of hell. That's Christian hate. It's contending for the faith when the rest of the world becomes to collapse around you. And you stand strong, not through your own strength, but through the kingdom of God, and prayerfully through the church that surrounds you and walks next to you and with you. That's what Christianity looks like. We signed up for this kind of treatment. The loss of jobs, loss of property, the loss of rights. We gave them up for this thing called the cross. Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. Like, would you come? Would you take the cross on you? And so these people begin crying out and they're confused. And then the Jews are like, okay, we have this guy. He's articulate. He's well put together. He's good in the city. Let's let Alexander handle this. Can you imagine that also? Like they're about to kill these two guys and people are screaming. You don't even know them. Like, All right. Everyone listen to me. And they're like, that guy's a Jew. And everyone just starts yelling at that guy. Right? And he, he just, like, okay, I'm done. That's it. That's all I got to say. I got to say no more. And for two hours, these crazy people finally get a rallied voice saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now you say, why did they care that he was Jewish? Because at that time, if you were a Christian, you were a subsect of Judaism. And again, we, we talked about this on, on our, in our groups this week, that you could be a proselyte. That means somebody, you may not have been born Jewish, but you would enter into the Jewish faith. That's all early Christianity was. It was people who were living out this subsect of Judaism, so they could not, they did not differentiate between the two, or at least the pagans did. Obviously, the Jewish people did. Right? They very much differentiated, saying, hey, no, 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 those are not of us, those are not us. But everyone else put them together. And so they begin to chant, and we're finally seeing it come together, which this is point two. Ignorance is the enemy of truth. It just is. Right? And that's, that's the thing is when we bring forth the truth of the gospel, you're going to have people who walk up to you with arguments. You're like, you can't really believe that, do you? Like, you, you, you cannot believe the movie Avatar is how the world really works. Oh, you do. I'm okay. I'm sorry. Right? Like, you start to, people start to unpack the reasons that we've got. And some of them are good. And some of them I've asked myself. But then there's moments where you're like, you don't actually believe that, do you? Like, you can't believe that to be true. But for them, it's like, I would literally believe anything than submit myself to a God. I would believe anything than what is true. They didn't know why they were yelling. At this point, it was just simply easier to be against the God of the Christians, of the followers of the way, than it was to even know what they were talking about. And that's why we always have to ask ourselves, why do I believe what I believe? Do I have a voice that could be articulate and honest and open, or would I just be rabble? And that's what happens here. So for two hours they yelled, united against God and His people. And here's just the truth. That's what's going to happen. Because this isn't just happening in the physical world. We saw this last week. There's spiritual things going on. And look, I, I can guarantee you, um, the devil is nowhere near as organized as God. Right? He actually says God is not a God of chaos or disorder, but of order. That means the devil is probably pretty chaotic. And that's probably not good when it comes to organizing things. 
And so, right, you bring all these chaotic people together and you're not going to see truth or something built. You're just going to see madness, anarchy. That's how you know the enemy's working. Is, is everything gets torn down instead of built back up. So let's keep reading. This is Acts 19, 28-34. So then the town clerk quieted the crowd. And he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there that who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis? And her sacred stone fell from the sky. Seeing that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. You've brought these men who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. There are proconsuls. Let them bring the charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it'll be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today. And since there's no cause that we can justify this commotion, and so when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So the town clerk was the guy who worked for the governor. The governor worked for a proconsul. There was a whole long line of people. But basically, he was a, a Roman official who would have reported back to somebody way high in the ranks and said, the people of Ephesus are rioting. Right? And that's going to become really important here in a second. And so what does the clerk say? He shows up. He's a baseline. He says, look, people, does what these men preach make Artemis any less powerful? Now, again, if they said yes, then Demetrius has no arguments. Demetrius can make no money. So they don't agree with the clerk necessarily. But the clerk says, if Artemis is true, why does it matter what they preach? Why are you guys so upset? Because for him, it really is about Artemis. He says, look, did not her stone fall from the sky? There was a, a famous kind of meteorite. It happened there. You also see this in um, Mars Hill at the Areopagus when Paul preaches and he says there's an unknown God. There was thought that whenever something fell from the sky, one of the gods either was showing up to earth or uh, uh, some god was punishing and they wasn't being worshipped properly. And he said, so that her stone fell from the sky. That can't be disputed. That was Artemis. Right? And he says, you're giving these men power they do not have. Why? Because having your own religion was perfectly legal in Rome at that time. There was nothing illegal about having your own religion. It was perfectly legal. Now, think about this for a moment. This is very wise. This is something you and I can say, hey, wait a minute. That should be how Christianity works. If I see this person who's just throwing this stuff out there, and I know Christianity is true, why am I getting so upset? Because it doesn't make what God has done any less impactful in my life. It doesn't make the cross less true. They're just missing out. They're just ignorant and uninformed. And he says, so if the craftsmen have a problem, they can take everyone to court. Right? We have a system set up for this called law and order, and there's a court for this. Right? Everything can be resolved in the normal assembly. Because you, Ephesians, are in danger of breaking the law, which was called rioting. Now, to you and I, we may hear that and think, oh, that's, that's bad. No, no, no. In the ancient world, as a Roman citizen, the last word, like that would have been the R word. You don't say riot. And if an official says riot, it's even worse. Why? Because the Romans were really good at one thing, putting down riots. And they made examples of people. In one day, they killed 30,000 people quelling a riot. 30,000 people quelling a riot. All right, so if there were 16,000 in this theater, basically what the clerk said, if you want to continue this, die for it. If you really believe this, die for it. And guess what? Everyone just walked away. Do you see the contrast? Two men brought before, take me. Paul, fighting to get in this arena to die. And the minute the clerk even whispers that there could be pain, they say, oh no, we're out. We're, we're out of this, no way. I'm not going to die for this. Where Paul said, I'm ready. That's what's going to happen. Right? See, if you look then, it didn't take much for this church to be persecuted. And a lot of people don't even know why they're persecuting the church. That's going to be true today. But we need to be ready. 
We need to know hardship is going to come because we did the right thing, not the wrong thing. Because it happened to Jesus, it will happen to us. And I want to, I want to put this to you though. Like we kind of live in a in a world that obviously is ever changing, and there's different ideologies and viewpoints. And it's easy to kind of look at it like you know Christianity is on the back end, like we're losing the culture wars and all that kind of stuff. I think what's really important is we need to stop kind of looking down and around, just keep looking up at Christ. Here's why: when you look at court cases. Christianity has almost won every court case it's ever, ever had. Coming from the baker in Colorado, he won. Now, he lost socially, but he won politically. Uh, when you talk about the quote-unquote separation of church and state, like if you go to most schools, like, you know, they say, well, they didn't allow Bibles. That's actually not true. Any student can bring in a Bible, right? Like there's, there's still a lot of things that happen, but I think we really like the idea of being persecuted sometimes. And I, and I think it, in a way, and I don't know if this is a bad thing, it's like, look, I, I want to share like Jesus. But there's some realities that we live just in a world far from that. Right? When we were talking about, you know, dying for faith, we talked about this several weeks ago about the church in China. And the pastor's like, how many of you have spent time in prison? And all but three people had been in prison. And all of them were like, yeah, that's why we're whispering down here in candlelight, memorizing scripture. But we'll go to prison again if we have to. Right? That's, that's the reality for so many people. Even if you go as recently as COVID-19, like pastors who were threatened by the state, they won their court cases. John MacArthur's church was awarded uh, several thousand dollars because there was no right for the state to infringe on their ability to worship. Tax purposes. If you read secular articles, they're lamenting, and why does the church always win here in America? Here's why I bring that up. is we need to be grateful instead of looking down and saying we're losing all the time. Are there places where the enemy gains ground? Sure. But we need to be grateful for what we have. We're not being drugged into theaters by those who worship Artemis to kill us. Not yet. Who knows? There may be a day. There may be a day. And I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying we need to be grateful for what we do have. And with that mindset, we need to be like Paul. If it's going down, it's not happening without me. That's one of the things I love when you look at the, the, the Christian church and you really start to get to know what like Christians do, like they don't get you know a lot of the same media attention. But one of the things the Baptists have is Texas Baptist men, right? It's a group of, of men who help for disaster relief. Right? And so when Hurricane Harvey hits, right, and there's no electricity and everybody's flooded out, <clears throat> and people are pouring out of Houston. Texas Baptist men is loading up chainsaws. They're loading up their cars, their trucks, their boats, and they're going into the storm. Well, everybody's leaving. During Katrina, people from Texas loaded up by the hundreds of almost thousands to go to Louisiana while well, everybody's fleeing. When you look at, the, at World War II, you have this church started by Brother Andrew in Soviet Russia, and everyone's fleeing the communists and persecution, and his church is going to the hearts. When everyone's fleeing, the church goes in. It's what we do. That's what Christ does. When you look at the plagues, and we talked a lot about that obviously during 2020, because I was like, you know what, I should probably, let's, let's look at the old guys who actually went through pandemics and see what they did. Right? Martin Luther, and, and then, um, of course, you have Charles Spurgeon, who was there during the cholera outbreak, which they didn't know was caused by water, so it was easier and prevented. But he didn't, they didn't know. And when he writes, he, he would not charge his church to go meet with people who were sick. But if they call, I'm going. I gotta go. I have to be there. Martin Luther said the same thing. He actually told pastors, he said, if you're going to flee Germany, you better make sure someone takes your place. Because people need you. People need the hope of the gospel. And I'm, he goes, I'm okay with you leaving, but you can't leave these people orphaned. You're their pastor. If you have one church member stay, you stay. He says, as for me, I'm going to drink my I'm, as he put it, he goes, I'm going to drink my potions, which was just medicine. I'm going to take my medicine. I'm going to fumigate. I'm going to tell you, hi from a distance. But if you need me, I'm there. If you need me at your deathbed, I'll be the last hand you hold. That's what the church does. When the world flees, we go in. And that still happens all over today. Problem is, media's not going to tell you that. They're going to tell you the next scandal that happens. 
a nice pastor that's falling. I had another one this week, which, praise God, it's not as bad as all the rest. I give, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, I want to talk about it here for just a moment because I think it's really important. We're seeing pastors crumble all around us in all these big mega churches. And if you're not familiar with Matt Chandler, he's a pastor of the Village Church. He leads the second largest missions network uh, here in America. And he's been there forever. And he had to step down this week because he had, as he put, unguarded contact with a woman. He said, what does that mean? He was, uh, you know, everyone says, oh, he must have had some kind of sexual falling, failing. You know, it's only going to get worse. Well, they released the text messages. He, the first thing that happened is a woman came up to him and said, Pastor, I think you're having an appropriate relationship with somebody in the church. So immediately, Matt said, if you believe that to be true, we need to go talk to the elders. So they went to the elders, and they, he gave up his phone. He gave up his social media. His wife was like, look, I know he's been talking to this lady. And here's what it came out after they even had lawyers involved in this. They, he was, they were sharing memes about alcohol. Now, to you and I, that may not seem like a whole bunch. But for him, he was messaging her every day, and this woman wasn't his wife. And they said, look, this was unwise. I, I should not have had this familiarity with another woman. Not as a pastor. And so he stepped down until he can be restored. We should applaud that. That's accountability. It's easy to throw stones and say, how could he be foolish? And da, 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 da. If that's the case, we'd all be in trouble. Like We all are so foolish sometimes. But here you have a mega church pastor who for most people was like, I don't even think that's a big deal. Actually, the husband wrote a letter to the church saying, look, we're friends with them. We, we have dinner with them. I didn't think anything of it. Like I didn't think it was inappropriate. And the lady was like, I don't think it was inappropriate. But once he was costed, and Matt was like, no, this was unwise. This was not above reproach. And I'm willing to accept what happens. And now you have folks who are blasting him all over the place, saying he's lying, there's more to it. Well, it's like, hey, wait a minute, if you want accountability, then you need to, like, we need to celebrate that. Like, okay, he did the right thing. He didn't hide it. As soon as he was approached, he gave it over to the people who needed to have it, including his wife. Why do I say that? Is That's what the church does. We, we, we watch out for each other. We need to be honest when we mess up. Because here's the, here's the unfortunate truth. When you're atraditional, and those of you are not the most traditional person, you may take some heat from folks that are. Okay, that's, that is a reality. Uh, I, unfortunately, I've been watching videos of folks who've deconverted from Christianity. And, there's, and what they shared just broke my heart and I cried. Because they said, I was, when I was a Christian, I was treated much better by atheists then now that I'm an atheist, then I've been treated by Christians. And I bring all that up for us to say, we need to stop looking at how the world does things. Say, Christ, help us be like you. We just need to keep our eyes fixed on him and say, okay, this person's deconverting. How do I love them and help draw them back to Christianity? Being awful to them is not going to do that. That's not going to bring anybody back. Being awful to them is not going to win somebody back. We have to be there with love. We have to be uncompromising. We also can't say, hey, I'm excited for you. Like, woohoo, you're choosing to go against the Almighty God. Like, that's not the response either. It is, hey, let's still have lunch on Friday. Like, that's the response. Like, let's still have a relationship. I'm going to pray for you. And you know I'm going to be there. And you know I'm going to come at you time and time again to ask you questions. Why? Because I love you. Not because I'm trying to tear you down. So yes, we need to be uncompromising. And I, and I think the best way to look at this is in Romans chapter 12. How do we handle the crowds, the riots? We love our enemies. We feed them. We clothe them. We give them something to drink. That's how the church fights its battles with our enemies. So that's point three. And that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. So we have to be ready to stand. When there's opposition. And we have to be ready when it's not from the outside, but from inside. I mean, even inside ourselves. I'll be honest, the person who's probably been the worst to me is the person I see in the mirror every day. Like, that's the person I have the hardest time looking at and contending with. It's me. Because there's things in me I, I wish weren't there. 
And so we have these battles and we just can't give them a pass. Of Like, look, am I living for my will or for God's will? Do I still have sin in my life that I'm just like, hey, it's not that big a deal? Or do I say, Lord, I'm struggling with it. Help me be delivered from it. Maybe we're full of apathy. Maybe it's like, hey, look, I, I'll serve God when I get around to it. I'll read my Bible when I get around to it. I'll do the next thing. God's just not a high priority in my life when he should be the first priority. Or maybe it was the opposite. We're like, okay, God, you got to do this now, and you got to do it this way, and the way I want it, and it's going to look, and out of our hurriedness, we're not following God. We're following what I think is spiritual. Maybe it's our tempers. Maybe it's our loneliness, our anxiety, our depression. Whatever. We have to contend for truth, even to ourselves. Right? The best preacher you're going to have is the person that preaches to you. And that's why husbands, fathers, we're called to be the priests of our family. We're called to, to be the pastors at home. That's our first ministry. And now you're like, wow, I don't really know a lot. That's fine. You just give your family what you do know. And you stand on that. But here's the thing is, love them. Love your family. Stand in the gap for them. Say, look, be able to apologize. Say, I was wrong when you're wrong. Because Romans 6, 6 says this, and this one says as we close. We know our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin may be brought to nothing so that we are no longer to be enslaved to sin. I think here in the world we live in, we're not as much in, in um, worry of bondage of exterior chains, but the ones we put on ourselves. When we allow sin, our culture, our own will, that's the bondage most of us live in. Not physical change, but spiritual ones. And that was me for so long. I'm going to share one last story and then we're going to close. I remember I was probably about 17 years old. And I don't know if I've shared this story before, but I think it's still important to share again. I was at this heavy metal concert. It's called Scream the Prayer was the tour. Right? And uh, we're watching this band. Um, and, you know, they're... They're loud, and I'll be honest, I, even, I never really heard them much before. It's called Sleeping Giant. And, and he's, they're, they're loud, and I, I understand kind of some of his, their words. I don't know them much of them. And he's, he stops, and he starts sharing his testimony. And it's wild. And everyone's talking, everyone's talking, and basically he just stops, and he says, because of me, this, this quadriplegic man killed himself. And the whole room just, phew, could have heard a pin drop. He begins to talk about the gospel changing him, restoring this family that he broke because he had an affair with this woman. Restoring him, restoring, uh, seeing God move through these crazy things. And he began talking about, you know, the deep throes of depression and anxiety, which I was in the middle of uh, hardcore at that time. And he says, if you want to accept Christ, I want you to raise your hand. Then he said, if you're a Christian, you find someone whose hand is raised and you pray with them. Go. Like, forget this concert. You go grab those people and you pray. Right? So we so grab, so here I am. I'm like, okay, there's two guys around me. We grab them and we take them outside into this like foyer area. We're praying for people. Praying for this kid who's talking about his depression, wanting to kill himself, all this stuff, which I'm experiencing myself. And I'm praying, and this kid like just smiles. He's like, thank you. It was this overwhelming thing. Right? And I should have been super happy. And I was sitting there like, God, how can I pray for this person? And I can see them delivered. When's it going to be my turn? I struggled for four more years. I said, Pastor, why are you sharing me that? Because there was a part of me that didn't want to let it go. If I was really honest. I'm going to be brutally honest with you. I made my chains blankets. And then I knew if I let them go, there'd be a higher expectation for my life. And I wasn't ready to handle that. So instead, I let depression just rule me and rock me. I let anxiety just rule me and rock me. I would go to people's homes, friends' homes, and I would sit in my car and just cry. I couldn't even go inside. These were people I knew. These weren't bad people. These, these were good church people who would invite me to their house. I, I would go to church events, and I would just like break down after going to church and just go sit in a corner because I couldn't handle being around people. And here I am feeling this call to ministry, and I was like, God, you're wrong. There's nothing in me that can minister to people. And I share all that to say, when I finally said, God, I'm done. I am truly done. I'm going to go to counseling. I'm going 
I'm going to do whatever it takes to be done with this. Jesus said, through a counselor, you're going to be okay. I had this 6,000-year-old man look at me in counseling. He said, I've been around a long time. I've seen a lot of kids like you. You're going to be just fine. And he says something very simple. My sheep know my voice. He says, so that thing inside you that hates you, is that your shepherd? I said, no. He says, so why are you listening? Be free. Just choose to listen to the right voice and not the one inside you. And you're like, well, that sounds so simple. If I could have done that a long time ago, I would have. But that was a problem. I didn't want to. This time it was different. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I was fine. It took time. It took medication. The Lord delivered me from anxiety and depression. Not that I don't struggle with it, but it has no bearing on how I live anymore. There's a lot of days. I had, I've had at least three panic attacks since this church started. It's not once kept me from doing anything with this church. But that's still who I am. But those aren't chains that rule me anymore. It's in there, but they're nothing. That's what Christ can do for you. He's our deliverer, our savior, our redeemer. And we got to be ready to walk through some hard times. And that's why he gave us the church, so you don't walk through the hard times alone. And as we close, we're going to pray here in just a moment, and we'll close out with a blessing. But I'm just going to ask everybody to, to just pray with me. You know, here's what we do, eyes closed and heads bowed, but here's just the reality. If you need to talk to God, talk to God. We have a prayer team that's going to be back there. Don't, don't go through this stuff by yourself. Look, you don't have to tell them nothing. You can just walk up and say, I just need to be prayed for today. Praise God. But you don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be afraid. You can tell somebody, hey, that's what I'm going through. We're going to have folks out there for that. But here we are as we pray. Lord, I, I just ask that we would all come to you just honest. Maybe we don't know you at all. Maybe we've been fighting to have a relationship with you because of the world around us. God, I pray that today, whoever is hearing me, will go talk to someone in the prayer team and say, today, I want to serve. I want to, I want to be a child of God today. That they come see me, that they come see somebody. Maybe they're home. Lord, work on their heart. Have them email us saying, look, today, I want to become a child of God. It's not about a special prayer. It's about us saying, with our mouth, as the scripture says, that we believe that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we would be saved. But that means when I say I believe he's Lord, that's not just my cognizant. That's my heart saying, it's yours. The good, the bad, the ugly, it's yours. And then we're saved. We go to heaven. You say, that sounds too good to be true. That's literally the point. God and his love is too good to be true sometimes. But maybe there's many of us who just have things that are holding us back. Maybe they are exterior. Maybe there are legitimately people who at work face opposition because they're Christians. God, I pray, give them the strength to stand. Give them the strength. Give them support. But maybe it's a lot of us, is what's inside. That we're just not ready to give up the things that bring us comfort, that take us away from you. Because one of the things I found out is there's no comfort like yours. It doesn't flee. It's not fleeting. It's not fickle like everything else. It's a peace that passes understanding. It's a healing that can heal all wounds, no matter how deep. And I can only find that in you, Jesus. So I pray that somebody would just, just cry out and say, Lord, that's me today. Heal me. Let me drop my chain so I can follow you freely. And so as we close, Lord, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, what we are not make us, and all of that should be in the image of your Son. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, and His face shine upon you, give you peace, and His countenance rest upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you guys. Have a blessed and wonderful week.